Welcome to Collective. Thank you for tuning in to our video sermon. We pray that this message will bless you greatly. Welcome to the third episode of Remembering Christ. And today we want to look into the Gospel of Luke. Um, Luke wrote two volumes of his writings. The first volume is the Gospel of Luke, and the second volume is the Book of Acts. So when we read Luke, we should read the two volumes together to get a full picture. So one of the special features of Luke is Jesus' inaugural speech when he read from Isaiah. The, he said, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, this does not only announce that salvation is now available to everybody, but it also means that how in accepting it that a person, an individual is restored, a community is revitalized, and how the kingdom of God comes on earth as his people, whom he also called the disciples, live out the gospel and his teaching. So today we want to zoom into one of Jesus' parable and find out how Luke wants us to remember Christ through this very famous parable in Luke chapter 15. If you have your Bible, if you have your device, turn with me to Luke 15, verse 1 to verse 2, and let's go. Now the tax collector and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Verse 11, Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pots that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death? I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servant, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So the father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you killed the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Would you please pray with me? Father, we give thanks to you this morning that we are able to come and hear your word. We ask that you open our hearts to hear you from your word. That, Lord, in remembering Christ, we hear what Jesus is speaking to our hearts and responds appropriately, you God. Give thanks to you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone says, Amen. Amen. You know, almost a week ago on a Monday, uh, I was searching for my Bible. It was my black bonded leather NIV Bible. It was my what? My black bonded leather NIV Bible, which I just bought this year. And it was a gift. It was sleek, it was fresh, and it was feel classy. And uh, I only use it in the office. Now, I have another NIV Bible, which is at home, which is a student edition, but the paper quality and the outlook 
is nothing compared to this. So on a Saturday, um, I brought it down to, from my office to the, to, to, to the service. And then after the service, I chucked everything behind my car because I, was, I have to rush back home you know, for, for CG. And I totally forgot about my black bonded leather NIV Bible. After two days, um, I started to search for it frantically. And I searched high and low in my office, at my house, in the car, and everywhere else that I could think of. And I was thinking, it couldn't be that someone has taken my Bible away because inside my Bible, there is a Chinese stamp, red color Chinese stamp over there with my name on it. So cannot be, right? I mean, take over already, you some more easy. You know, so, and I was thinking, who dares to take the teachers, the rabbis, black bonded leather, NIV Bible? So I went to the usher's room and I searched, you know, in the last lost and found section, but it was nowhere to be found. I was getting mad because that Bible was not just a Bible. It was my first black bonded leather NIV Bible, right? So in my rational mind, I was preparing myself already. I was looking and imagining, okay, prepare for the worst, you know, just in case I cannot find it. I'm already seeing myself going to Canaan land and searching for my replacement Bible, paying the money, and until I say, no, let me search again. Let me search again. It must be somewhere. So I told the intern, I said that in case I cannot find it, can you please go with me to Canaan Land to get one? But in my heart, I was really saying, can I please don't get one new one? So I went to the car. It was, back, it was a broad daylight. Uh, you should be able to see the Bible, right? But I couldn't find anything. So I searched, I searched, and I stretched my fingers on my hand to the furthest corner at the car floor. And suddenly, at the darkest corner, I saw a square black thing. It was my black bonded leather NIV Bible. And I almost exploded in tears. <sighs> I found it unscratched, unwounded, safe and sound. And I will make sure it never leave my office again. <laughs> How many of you could actually identify with that kind of feeling when you lost something and the sense of loss and that kind of sense of joy when you actually found it back? And uh, how would you, you know, you would... What about when you lost something or even someone in the shopping mall, like your kid? And then when you found that something or that someone back, how would it be, you know? You would be exploded like, finally found it! It is the same when Jesus answered the complaint from the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. I mean, why would he, they were asking, why would he permit such kind of, you know, willingly permit that kind of access for people to come for tax collectors and sinners to be able to hear him and to be able to come near him? So Jesus told them a series of parables in reply. But really, the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost sons actually contain only one central theme. So every time when you read the Bible, especially when it comes to parable in the New Testament, okay, always remember that every parable has only one main thing. Turn to your neighbor and say, oh. So in this case, Jesus wanted to use this parable to let the religious people know that if a man were to be so happy that he would celebrate when he found one out of the 99 sheep, and if a woman would be so happy that he would, she would go and celebrate, ask the neighbors to come, celebrate with me, when she found one out of her ten coins, and there was a father who would throw a huge party and get people to celebrate together with him just because one of his two sons comes home, how much more would God be to rejoice with us when a sinner come home or the most insignificant person comes back home to Jesus. So this parable of Jesus, which people usually call the prodigal son, and some people prefer to drop the word prodigal and call it the lost son or the lost sons. And lately, many rename it the parable to the loving father or like what 
Dr. Timothy Keller would say, the prodigal God, or Pak Ji would say, the prodigal God. Now, prodigal means reckless, like what just now Adrian was explaining a little bit. I almost felt he was preaching my sermon. <sighs> prodigal simply means lavish, simply means extravagantly spending. So it is known as, this parable is also known as the most favored parable because it teaches us about God in three aspects. Firstly, at the returning of the lost, God greatly celebrates. At the despising of the lost, God tenderly supplicates. And at the seeking of the lost, God personally demonstrates. At the returning of the lost, God greatly celebrates. Now, Paji taught us exactly one year ago this parable. And he said that the younger brother's demand on his share of his father's property was unheard of, especially when the father is still alive. So we don't know why he made such kind of requests. Maybe he wasn't getting along well at home, or maybe some other reasons we do not know. But because he was a younger brother, he was entitled one-third of the property. You see, if you are an eldest brother in a home, you get two portions. Okay, this is according to the law. In a, you can find it in Deuteronomy 21. But the word property here, it also means or can be translated as life. In other words, it is not just the father's property being distributed. It was his life being divided when the request was made. No wonder this request was equivalent to wishing his father dead. Now, any mis Middle Eastern father or even Asian father, you would, you would dare to go and ask your father for a property when he's still around, he would be so mad at you and probably disown the children. But this father respected his son's decision. So the younger brother got his wish, and he quickly distanced himself into a wasteful, a reckless living. And if it's in the modern day, someone said, you know, very likely he would be squandering and first thing he would do is, is to upgrade his wardrobe. Um, today it might be a robe by Prada and tomorrow maybe a timepiece by Patek Philippe and uh, who knows, a lot of saddlebags by Gucci. And the man had taste. At least this is what people tell him. You know, everybody was saying, yes, you are the man, you are the man. Strangers will be laughing at his joke and people will continually want to hang out with him. The prodigal life feels great. You know, it could, he could practically buy everything, anything, and even anyone. Now, there were new pleasures, but there were also deeper degradation. Life was shrinking. Money was shrinking. And unfortunately, a famine struck. And now there was a huge shortage of food all across the land that forces him to go and work for a citizen of that land. Not only was he forced to work for a Gentile as a slave or a day laborer, which is worse than a house servant, and this person couldn't be bothered to even feed him well. He sent him to feed pigs. And that was not just exploitation. That was total humiliation especially for a Jew. And if you have noticed in this story, even the pigs have better welfare compared to the younger brother. You know, I mean, he was probably be thinking, where did everybody go? You know, those people who call me friends, where are they now? Those days they treated me like a star. But now I'm here. You know, there is a, I'm no, not a star anymore. But here in the open space where there are full of stars feeding pigs, and uh, in his desperation, he came to his senses when he found himself asking, why am I even here starving to die? Perhaps he might be suspected that his father had disowned him by now. And therefore, he hoped, all he hoped was that he can go back, don't be your son, never mind, just be a slave. Because at least a slave gets to eat. And now I'm here starving and feeding pig. So guess what did he do? He said, the Bible says that while he was still afar off, a long way off, the father saw him and he was filled with compassion and he ran to his son and he hugged him and he kissed him. You see, my friends, the father forgave even before the younger brother approached. The father must have been scanning the horizon day after day after day to be able to notice that there was a shadow that comes and this looked like his younger son and that he will go and be moved 
to his heart and go and run after him. And yes, sometimes, you know, this, this, this father probably will be thinking, I mean, this son went out of home carrying with him so much of money and wealth. Who knows, maybe halfway down the road, he will be robbed and killed. But still, you see, my friends, sometimes when we insist our way to do it, God will also allow us to do it. Not because He doesn't love us, but because He loved us too much that He allows it. But He would be like this father who keeps thinking of his lost son to return. So the father accepted him, hugged him, even before the younger brother apologized. And God would say, can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. The father's heart was moved with compassion and mercy. The father ran hurriedly, hurriedly to the younger brother and poured out his affection all over his own child before he could say anything. My friends, how much more would God do that to welcome his children even before, even before we come to him and say all our well-rehearsed repentance prayer, God would have already accepted you and welcomed you home. So no matter how far you think you have gone away from God, no matter what you have done, no matter where you have gone, just remember this. There is no place so far that this love cannot reach. There is no pit so deep that the love of God is not deeper still. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. The father restored, my friends, even before the younger brother appealed. The one third of the property is now lost. Now, the best robe, the ring, the sandals, everything would be belong to the father. The father's robe would mean acceptance, a kind of reinstatement, put him back in the right place. His ring would probably would mean authority given to his son. And the sandals are only meant for sons that are at home because slaves who are at home don't wear sandals. They go barefooted. In other words, this younger brother's full sonship was restored even before he made any appeal, even before he made any request. Friends, when we repent, we often think of doing something. You know, we want to, can I do something for the church? Can I give this? Can I do this? We, we try to do things for compensation. But God's grace goes beyond our own dead works. He restores everything back. Our position is to be children of the Most High God. And if we are heirs of God, then we are joint heir with Jesus Christ. And not only that, the Father say, bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Sometimes you may think that when you turn to God, you know, it's like you surrender. Lord, I surrender. Yeah, you felt that you have lost everything. It's the moment that you feel the most lost. It's like, I lost it. But it is exactly that attitude that you need to come and approach God. The Bible says, blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of God. He does not only forgive completely, He would come running and lavish His love upon you and restore you through your true identity, a child of God. And guess what the Bible says? Heaven will rejoice with uproarious joy even when the most insignificant sinner comes home. My younger sister left home once. It was a long story. And I just talked to my dad and interviewed him a couple of days ago about how she feel and all that. He said he was very worried. And uh, in his mind, you know, scenes after scenes of stuff has gone through of how my sister has grown throughout the years and what had actually happened, trying to find out what had happened. So there could be some self-questioning, some self-condemnation and the next day, the first thing in the morning, he said, was that he would go and contact all her classmates that she, he could get hold of. And he found that she actually walked out of the house in the middle of the night and got her friend to send her to a nearby budget hotel. The next day, she came back 
on her own. Perhaps her classmates advise her to do so. But the point is this. My dad says that when she finally came home, he didn't question her. He didn't scold her. He just let things go back to normal. An earthly father would do such a thing. You know, just maintain the status quo. Yep, just come back home. Right, we always say that. But I want you to know that we have a heavenly father who loves us so much that when we come home, not only does he not scold us, does he not condemn us, but he would also make sure that his love fills us so much that we will not think about leaving home ever again. It is just two more weeks to Easter. Our church has three services prepared. Can we all go out to reach out to our friends, our families, and bring them back to the Father? You know, maybe it's time to recall how you became a Christian. Maybe it's time for you to think back how the grace of God and the love of God felt, filled you, that grabbed hold of you, that now it is motivating you to go out and reach out to people and bring the lost back. The bro or the girlfriend whom you always wanted to invite to the church, the member who left God for whatever reasons, you know, that friend who used to be on fire for God but now no longer. Perhaps all they are waiting for is just your phone call an invitation so that they will be able to come back home to the Father. At the returning of the lost, God greatly celebrates. So in this Easter, let's also join in with God. Let's not just see the party happening. Secondly, at the, dis at the despising of the lost, God tenderly supplicates. Okay, I know this is the unusual word, supplicates, but really it's just for rhyming purpose. Okay, celebrate, then supplicates, lah, okay? So learn a new word, all right? But really, it just means that God gently pleads. Now, here in this point, it must be act number two. This now was scene number one, act one. Now it's like act two. And now the music, you know, turned to become a minor key, okay? Now, the elder brother came back from working in the field and he was greeted by an unusual sound of music and dancing. So he summoned his servants and found out the great news. What is the great news? Your brother has come back home and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. If you read the Message Bible, it says barbecue beef. Okay? Rather than joining in the party, rather than sharing the joy of his father, the elder brother got angry. He was boiling mad. He refused to go in. He said, what is this party all about? You know, the elder brother accused, but the father pleaded. He says to his father, he said, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you, and you never and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never give me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But this son of yours squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you killed the fattened calf for him. Firstly, he pulled out his sacrifices. See, all these years, look at my sacrifices. Huh? Tell me, who sacrificed for the home house the most? Me. And secondly, he pulled out his moral report card. Flawless. Who has never disobeyed your order? Me. And all that I want, I don't even require a fattened calf. All that I want is just a young goat party. I even didn't ask you for it. You know, he would be saying that, Father, open your eyes, please, for goodness sake. And he said, this dirty son of yours, son of yours, who wasted all your money, and who knows, he probably, probably could be womanizing. Well, since he's already in the pig business, why not just make it more fishy, right? So, yeah. And once he come home, you didn't even care to punish him, right? All you do is you kill the fattened calf which was supposed to be reserved for me. So the sin of the young elder brother was what? The sin of the elder brother was that he was too good. He was so good that he was so proud that he was good and that he was so assured that there was no improvement needed. Improvement was pos impossible. So good that he would just rename everything called sin and rename it into, oh, it was just a mistake. Oh, it was just an error. Come on, tell me, which human, human being don't do that? You know, 
Ah, it's not a sin. So good that his good has turned into bad. The elder brother separated himself, but the father pleaded. Somehow in his mind, the father was a very strict taskmaster, only interested in making him work like a slave. You know, in Chinese it's called work like a horse and cow. He was judgmental. He was too preoccupied with his own look, how good I am as a Christian. And there was no room whatsoever for him to feel for his brother. The elder brother was selfish, but the father pleaded. He was self-righteous. He totally forgot that all that he has was not his. All he has comes from his father, two-thirds of the property. And it was true that he never left his house. Yes, clap hands, well done. But his heart was the furthest away from his, younger, from his father than his younger brother. And the reason why he stayed on, probably, the reason why he stayed on was because he can't wait that the two-thirds of the property comes to him when the father died. And, and, you know, all these years, he has been keeping all this track record. And who knows? He was accusing his brother for sleeping with the prostitutes. Who knows? Maybe it was he who was toying with that kind of idea all this while. He was the one who wanted the prodigal life so badly. And yet, the father came and pleaded with him. He said, my son or my child, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours, not son of yours, your brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Despite his faithfulness to stay at home, he never really took advantage of the daily opportunity to fellowship and to rejoice with his father. His heart was totally out of sync. When the father was scanning across the horizon, waiting for the, fa- for the son to come back, where was he? He, was still not, he doesn't even feel it. And some commentator even said this, it would be very unimaginable if the younger brother comes home and then the first person that he saw was not the father but the, young, the elder brother. You know, what would, what would he get from him? Now, if we make a cross-check, Jesus' parable at this point could be very sharply pointing to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. But Christians, don't be overconfident. Perhaps we could also be that elder brother. It is not that God doesn't want us to do good or doesn't want us to be set apart for Him, but we shouldn't be critical. You know, we shouldn't be judgmental or unloving to the extent that our outward doing of the things of God has become dull, tasteless, and boring. We need to examine our hearts today. What is stopping us from joining in with the celebration, to be excited and to rejoice with the Father at the returning of these, our own brothers and sisters? At the despising of the lost, God tenderly pleads or supplicates. Finally, at the seeking of the lost, God personally demonstrates. The story ended here in the parable. And we don't know if the elder brother actually softened down and followed the father went into the house. Or maybe they shook hand, the two brothers, they shook hand, hug each other, kiss, kiss, and then, yeah, become, yeah, bro again. Well, the music was still playing. The father was still pleading. The younger brother was still celebrating, wearing the robe, the ring, the sandals, and possibly tasting the barbecue beef. But the elder brother was still outside with a pleading father. Perhaps Jesus ended here because, just like the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, so that we too could respond. The tax collectors and the sinner were welcomed by Jesus and they wanted to hear Him. They wanted to be heard by Him because Jesus came to preach the good news to the poor and to proclaim the favourable year of the Lord. But they too had an elder brother who would despise him, accuse them, feeling absolutely unhappy when Jesus provides such a lavish access and hospitality to them. The elder brother was still forever so morally good, so flawless. The standard is so high that nobody can achieve and they could never share a meal together. And we can understand it because let's look at the last words again. 
the father said, my son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. Which is literally true because all is left is a two-third of the property which belongs to the elder brother, right? The rope, the ring, the sandals, the fattened calf all belong to the elder brother. You see, it costs it costs an enormous price, someone an enormous price for the younger brother to return home. It is not free. It is not, it is not easy or simple to be saved. The elder brother has to pay out of his own expense and he is angry about it. Friends, why would Jesus want to paint such kind of nasty picture of an elder brother? So that the Pharisees and the tax collector would see how they look like and so that we can know how a true elder brother looks like. A true elder brother would do what? A true elder brother would say to his father, Father, let me go out and look for my younger brother. And if, I ha if he has squandered off everything that you have given to him, don't worry, I will pay for him out of my own expense so that I can bring him back home safe and sound so that you can rejoice and everyone will be celebrating together. It was just too bad too bad that the younger brother had no such elder brother. But we do. We do. Jesus Christ is our true elder brother. He didn't go to another town to look for us. He came down from heaven to earth. He didn't pay for us what we have squandered away with gold and silver, but He paid for us with His life. And on the cross, he was stripped naked so that you and I can be clothed with a robe of honour that we don't even deserve. On the cross, He said, My God, my God. It was the only moment that He never called my Father. You know why? Because it was at that moment that your sins and my sins were imputed on Him. That when God looks at Him, He wasn't even treated as a son so that you and I could be treated as sons. And there he paid the debt. That deep inside us, we all know that this debt is actually ours. He had everything that the Father had, and yet he chose to share them all with us. He paid the enormous price for us with his life, at his own expense, just so that he can bring us back to the Father. And at the seeking of the loss, God demonstrates personally. He personally comes and demonstrates it through Jesus Christ, our true elder brother, that he loves us, that he would, how he would rejoice so greatly, you know, always be on the lookout to welcome us back home again. Today, what are, what type of brother are you? Some of us, many of us, we are the younger brother type. Why? Because guess where the younger brother would go when he leave house and go to another city? Of course, go to KL, right? Younger brother don't go to Parit Bunta or Sungai Lalang or Ulu, Iram or what, right? Go to KL, of course. But yet, some of us, you know, we came here, we studied, and some of you, someone brought you to church. Uh, you probably were touched by the love of God. And finally, you gave your hearts to Jesus. You were once lost, but you are eventually found. But somehow, life got busy and, you know, you are stuck with, you, you start to serve God and you start to read the Bible, go to CG, you know, be a good Christian, and, and then work. And somehow, maybe certain things happen and it didn't, happen, it didn't go as you, as you expect it to be. And slowly, you come to church, same seat that you were sitting on, but you look around, and in your heart, you have this kind of, you're mad. You're mad at people who hurt you. You're mad that, at God. You're saying that, you know, why is it that I've been doing all things right, and yet, this person is blessed, and he's happy, and I'm not? You have slowly become the elder brother. And even right now, you know, when we when we want to, when we want to, you hear about, oh, Easter, go and invite your friends, reach out to them. 
But in your heart, you're like, ah, I know. This group of people, they don't deserve one. Go and reach out to my uncle, ah, cannot one, cannot one. You know, in your heart, you already predetermined that this person would never be able to come home. In your heart. It's not that you don't want them to come, but in your heart, you already said, no. But look at the story. Look at this parable. God is calling and welcoming everyone home. God loves them. And His love is, you know, He would would be scanning on the horizon for all these people day after day like the Father. And when the, and when the son comes home, he would be welcoming them, hurriedly run after, hug them. But how does this father's heart and our heart, what's the dif- what's, what is causing the difference between the father's heart and our heart? Maybe today some of us, we need to feel that love once again. To have that assurance, remember, to the elder brother, the father pleads, come back home, come. The father does not come here to come and condemn us, tell us, oh, you're wrong. No, the father is pleading with us, come home. You are also my son. Everything I have is yours. And today, can we also be a true elder brother, just like how Jesus did? When we go out and reach out to people, to the lost, Let's also feel the heart of the Father. Let's also not predetermine in our hearts that, no, this person cannot be saved, this person cannot be saved. All you need, you know, the welcoming back of the sinners is not our, is not our job. It's the Father's job because it's His heart to welcome back, to celebrate, to party. But all we need is to be that true elder brother and go and reach out and search and welcome them back, bring them home. At any cost, bring them home and the Father will celebrate and the love will be poured out on Him, lavished on Him. Today, we need to respond. Shall we just close our eyes, bow our heads? Thank you for watching this sermon. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give online or make a direct transfer to the account below. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more messages like this one.